Section 21 of The Chronicles of Wolfert's Roost and Other Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Chronicles of Wolfert's Roost and Other Papers by Washington Irving. The Count Van Horn. During the minority of Louis the Fifteenth, while the Duke of Orleans was regent of France, a young Flemish nobleman, the Count Antoine Joseph Van Horn, made his sudden appearance in Paris, and by his character, conduct, and the subsequent disasters in which he became involved, created a great sensation in the high circles of the proud aristocracy. He was about twenty-two years of age, tall, finely formed, with a pale romantic countenance, and eyes of remarkable brilliancy and wildness. He was one of the most ancient and highly esteemed families of European nobility, being of the line of the princes of Horn and Overeek, sovereign counts of Hautkirk, and hereditary grand veneur of the empire. The family took its name from the little town and seigneury of Horn in Brabant, and was known as early as the eleventh century among the little dynasties of the Netherlands, and since that time by a long line of illustrious generations. At the Peace of Utrecht, when the Netherlands passed under subjection to Austria, the house of Van Horn came under the domination of the emperor at the time we treat of two of the branches of this ancient house were extinct the third and only surviving branch was represented by the reigning prince maximilian emmanuel van horn twenty-four years of age who resided in honourable and courtly style on his hereditary domains at bossigny in the netherlands and his brother the count antoine joseph who is the subject of this memoir. The ancient house of Van Horn, by the intermarriage of its various branches with the noble families of the continent, had become widely connected and interwoven with the high aristocracy of Europe. The Count Antoine, therefore, could claim relationship to many of the proudest names in Paris, in fact, he was grandson, by the mother's side, of the Prince de Ligne, and even might boast of affinity to the regent, the Duke of Orléans himself. There were circumstances, however, connected with his sudden appearance in Paris and his previous story that placed him in what is termed a false position, a word of baleful significance in the fashionable vocabulary of France. The young Count had been a captain in the service of Austria, but had been cashiered for irregular conduct, and for disrespect to Prince Louis of Baden, commander-in-chief. To check him in his wild career, and bring him to sober reflection, his brother the Prince caused him to be arrested, and sent to the old castle of Van Wert in the domains of Horn. This was the same castle in which, in former times, John Van Horn, stadtholder of Gelder, had imprisoned his father, a circumstance which has furnished Rembrandt with the subject of an admirable painting. The governor of the castle was one Van Wert, grandson of the famous John Van Wert, the hero of many a popular song and legend. It was the intention of the prince that his brother should be held in honourable durance, for his object was to sober and improve, not to punish and afflict him. Van Wert, however, was a stern, harsh man of violent passions. He treated the youth in a manner that prisoners and offenders were treated in the strongholds of the robber counts of Germany in old times, confined him in a dungeon, and inflicted on him such hardships and indignities that the irritable temperament of the young count was roused to continual fury, which ended in insanity. For six months was the unfortunate youth kept in this horrible state, without his brother the prince being informed of his melancholy condition, 
or of the cruel treatment to which he was subjected. At length, one day, in a paroxysm of frenzy, the Count knocked down two of his jailers with a beetle, escaped from the castle of Van Wert, and eluded all pursuit and after roving about in a state of distraction, made his way to Bossigny, and appeared like a spectre before his brother. The prince was shocked at his wretched, emaciated appearance, and his lamentable state of mental alienation. He received him with the most compassionate tenderness, lodged him in his own room, appointed three servants to attend and watch over him day and night, and endeavoured by the most soothing and affectionate assiduity to atone for the past act of rigour with which he reproached himself when he learned however the manner in which his unfortunate brother had been treated in confinement and the course of brutalities that had led to his mental malady he was aroused to indignation his first step was to cashier van wert from his command that violent man set the prince at defiance, and attempted to maintain himself in his government and his castle, by instigating the peasants, for several leagues round, to revolt. His insurrection might have been formidable against the power of a petty prince, but he was put under the ban of the empire, and seized as a state prisoner. The memory of his grandfather, the oft-sung John Van Wert, alone saved him from a gibbet, but he was imprisoned in the strong tower of Hornopsy. There he remained until he was eighty-two years of age, savage, violent, and unconquered to the last, for we are told that he never ceased fighting and thumping as long as he could close a fist or wield a cudgel. In the meantime, a course of kind and gentle treatment and wholesome regimen, and above all, the tender and affectionate assiduity of his brother, the prince, produced the most salutary effects upon Count Antoine. He gradually recovered his reason, but a degree of violence seemed always lurking at the bottom of his character, and he required to be treated with the greatest caution and mildness for the least contradiction exasperated him in this state of mental convalescence he began to find the supervision and restraints of brotherly affection insupportable so he left the netherlands furtively and repaired to paris whither in fact it is said he was called by motives of interest to make arrangements concerning a valuable estate which he inherited from his relative the princess d'epinay on his arrival in Paris, he called upon the Marquis of Crequy and other of the high nobility with whom he was connected. He was received with a great courtesy, but as he brought no letters from his elder brother the prince, and as various circumstances of his previous history had transpired, they did not receive him into their families nor introduce him to their ladies. Still, they feted him in bachelor's style, gave him gay and elegant suppers at their separate apartments, and took him to their boxes at the theatres. He was often noticed, too, at the doors of the most fashionable churches, taking his stand among the young men of fashion, and at such times his tall, elegant figure, his pale but handsome countenance, and his flashing eyes distinguished him from among the crowd, and the ladies declared that it was almost impossible to support his ardent gaze. The Count did not afflict himself much at his limited circulation in the fastidious circles of the high aristocracy. He relished society of a wilder and less ceremonious caste, and meeting with loose companions to his taste, soon ran into all the excesses of the capital in that most licentious period it is said that in the course of his wild career he had an intrigue with a lady of quality a favourite of the regent that he was surprised by that prince in one of his interviews that sharp words passed between them 
and that the jealousy and vengeance thus awakened ended only with his life. About this time the famous Mississippi scheme of law was at its height, or rather it began to threaten that disastrous catastrophe which convulsed the hull financial world. Every effort was making to keep the bubble inflated. The vagrant population of France was swept off from the streets at night and conveyed to Havre de Grasse to be shipped to the projected colonies. Even laboring people and mechanics were thus crimped and spirited away. As Count Antoine was in the habit of sallying forth at night in disguise in pursuit of his pleasures, he came near being carried off by a gang of crimps. It seemed, in fact, as if they had been lying in wait for him, as he had experienced very rough treatment at their hands. Complaint was made of his case by his relation, the Marquis de Crequy, who took much interest in the youth, but the Marquis received mysterious intimations not to interfere in the matter, but to advise the Count to quit Paris immediately. If he lingers, he is lost. This has been cited as a proof that vengeance was dogging at the heels of the unfortunate youth, and only watching for an opportunity to destroy him. Such opportunity occurred but too soon. Among the loose companions with whom the Count had become intimate were two who lodged in the same hotel with him. One was a youth only twenty years of age, who passed himself off as the Chevalier des Tempes, but whose real name was Lestang, the prodigal son of a Flemish banker. The other, named Laurent de Mille, a Piedmontese, was a cashiered captain, and at the time an esquire in the service of the dissolute Princess de Carignan, who kept gambling tables in her palace. It is probable that gambling propensities had brought these young men together, and that their losses had driven them to desperate measures. Certain it is that all Paris was suddenly astounded by a murder which they were said to have committed. What made the crime more startling was that it seemed connected with the great Mississippi scheme, at that time the fruitful source of all kinds of panics and agitations. A Jew, a stockbroker, who dealt largely in shares of the Bank of Law, founded on the Mississippi scheme, was the victim. The story of his death is variously related. The darkest account states that the Jew was decoyed by these young men into an obscure tavern, under pretext of negotiating with him for bank shares, to the amount of one hundred thousand crowns, which he had with him in his pocket-book. Lestang kept watch upon the stairs. The Count and Demi entered with the Jew into a chamber. In a little while there were heard cries and struggles from within. A waiter passing by the room looked in, and seeing the Jew weltering in his blood, shut the door again, double-locked it, and alarmed the house. Lestang rushed downstairs, made his way to the hotel, secured his most portable effects, and fled the country. The Count and Demi endeavored to escape by the window, but were both taken and conducted to prison. A circumstance which occurs in this part of the Count's story seems to point him out as a faded man. His mother and his brother, the Prince Van Horn, had received intelligence some time before at Bossigny of the dissolute life the Count was leading at Paris and of his losses at play. They dispatched a gentleman of the Prince's household to Paris to pay the debts of the Count and persuade him to return to Flanders, or, if he should refuse, to obtain an order from the regent for him to quit the capital. Unfortunately, the gentleman did not arrive at Paris until the day after the murder. The news of the Count's arrest and imprisonment on a charge of murder caused a violent sensation among the high aristocracy. 
all those connected with him who had treated him hitherto with indifference found their dignity deeply involved in the question of his guilt or innocence a general convocation was held at the hotel of the marquis de crequy of all the relatives and allies of the house of horn it was an assemblage of the most proud and aristocratic personages of paris inquiries were made into the circumstances of the affair it was ascertained beyond a doubt that the jew was dead and that he had been killed by several stabs of a poniard in escaping by the window it was said that the count had fallen and been immediately taken but that demy had fled through the streets pursued by the populace and had been arrested at some distance from the scene of the murder that the count had declared himself innocent of the death of the jew and that he had risked his own life in endeavouring to protect him but that demy on being brought back to the tavern confessed to a plot to murder the broker and rob him of his pocket-book and inculpated the count in the crime another version of the story was that the count van horn had deposited with the broker bank shares to the amount of eighty eight thousand livres that he had sought him in this tavern which was one of his resorts and had demanded the shares that the jew had denied the deposit that a quarrel had ensued in the course of which the jew struck the count in the face that the latter transported with rage had snatched up a knife from a table and wounded the jew in the shoulder and that thereupon demy who was present and who had likewise been defrauded by the broker fell on him and dispatched him with blows of a poniard and seized upon his pocket-book that he had offered to divide the contents of the latter with the count pro rata of what the usurer had defrauded them that the latter had refused the proposition with disdain and that at a noise of persons approaching both had attempted to escape from the premises but had been taken regard the story in any way they might appearances were terribly against the count and the noble assemblage was in great consternation what was to be done to ward off so foul a disgrace and to save their illustrious escutcheons from this murderous stain of blood their first attempt was to prevent the affair from going to trial and their relative from being dragged before a criminal tribunal on so horrible and degrading a charge they applied therefore to the regent to intervene his power to treat the count as having acted under an access of his mental malady and to shut him up in a madhouse the regent was deaf to their solicitations he replied coldly that if the count was a madman one could not get rid too quickly of madmen who were furious in their insanity the crime was too public and atrocious to be hushed up or slurred over justice must take its course seeing there was no avoiding the humiliating scene of a public trial the noble relatives of the count endeavoured to predispose the minds of the magistrates before whom he was to be arraigned they accordingly made urgent and eloquent representations of the high descent and noble and powerful connections of the count set forth the circumstances of his early history his mental malady the nervous irritability to which he was subject and his extreme sensitiveness to insult or contradiction by these means they sought to prepare the judges to interpret everything in favour of the count and even if it should prove that he had inflicted the mortal blow on the usurer to attribute it to access of insanity provoked by insult to give full effect to these representations the noble conclave determined to bring upon the judges the dazzling rays of the whole assembled aristocracy accordingly on the day that the trial took place 
the relations of the count to the number of fifty-seven persons of both sexes and of the highest rank repaired in a body to the palace of justice and took their stations in a long corridor which led to the court-room here as the judges entered they had to pass in review this array of lofty and noble personages who saluted them mournfully and significantly as they passed any one conversant with the stately pride and jealous dignity of the french noblesse of that day may imagine the extreme state of sensitiveness that produced this self-abasement it was confidently presumed however by the noble suppliants that having once brought themselves to this measure their influence over the tribunal would be irresistible there was one lady present however madame de beaufremont who was affected with the scottish gift of second sight and related such dismal and sinister apparitions as passing before her eyes that many of her female companions were filled with doleful presentiments unfortunately for the count there was another interest at work more powerful even than the high aristocracy the infamous but all potent abbe dubois the grand favorite and bosom counsellor of the regent was deeply interested in the scheme of law and the prosperity of his bank and of course in the security of the stockbrokers indeed the regent himself is said to have dipped deep in the mississippi scheme dubois and law therefore exerted their influence to the utmost to have the tragic affair pushed to the extremity of the law and the murderer of the broker punished in the most signal and appalling manner certain it is the trial was neither long nor intricate the count and his fellow-prisoner were equally inculpated in the crime and both were condemned to a death the most horrible and ignominious to be broken alive on the wheel as soon as the sentence of the court was made public all the nobility in any degree related to the house of van horn went into mourning another grand aristocratical assemblage was held and a petition to the regent on behalf of the count was drawn out and left with the marquis de crequy for signature this petition set forth the previous insanity of the count and showed that it was a hereditary malady in his family it stated various circumstances in mitigation of his offence and implored that his sentence might be commuted to perpetual imprisonment upward of fifty names of the highest nobility beginning with the prince de ligne and including cardinals archbishops dukes marquises etc together with the ladies of equal rank were signed to this petition by one of the caprices of human pride and vanity it became an object of ambition to get enrolled among the illustrious suppliants a kind of testimonial of noble blood to prove relationship to a murderer the marquis de crequy was absolutely besieged by applicants to sign and had to refer their claims to this singular honor to the prince de ligne the grandfather of the count many who were excluded were highly incensed and numerous feuds took place nay the affronts thus given to the morbid pride of some aristocratical families passed from generation to generation for fifty years afterward the duchess of mazarin complained of a slight which her father had received from the marquis de crequy which proved to be something connected with the signature of this petition this important document being completed the illustrious body of petitioners male and female on saturday evening the eve of palm sunday repaired to the palais royal the residence of the regent and were ushered with great ceremony but profound silence into his hall of council they had appointed four of their number as deputies to present the petition 
viz the cardinal de rohan the duc de raf the prince de Lines, and the marquis de crequy after a little while the deputies were summoned to the cabinet of the regent they entered leaving the assembled petitioners in a state of the greatest anxiety as time slowly wore away and the evening advanced the gloom of the company increased several of the ladies prayed devoutly the good princess of armagnac told her beads the petition was received by the regent with a most unpropitious aspect in asking the pardon of the criminal said he you display more zeal for the house of van horn than for the service of the king the noble deputies enforced the petition by every argument in their power they supplicated the regent to consider that the infamous punishment in question would reach not merely the person of the condemned not merely the house of van horn but also the genealogies of princely and illustrious families in whose armorial bearings might be found the quarterings of this dishonoured name gentlemen replied the regent it appears to me the disgrace consists in the crime rather than in the punishment the prince de Lene spoke with warmth i have in my genealogical standard said he four escutcheons of van horn and of course have four ancestors of that house i must have them erased and effaced and there would be so many blank spaces like holes in my heraldic ensigns there is not a sovereign family which would not suffer through the rigour of your royal highness nay all the world knows that in the thirty-two quarterings of madame your mother there is an escutcheon of van horn very well replied the regent i will share the disgrace with you gentlemen seeing that a pardon could not be obtained the cardinal de rohan and the marquis de crequy left the cabinet but the prince de Lene and the duc de Havre remained behind the honour of their houses more than the life of the unhappy count was the great object of their solicitude they now endeavoured to obtain a minor grace they represented that in the netherlands and in germany there was an important difference in the public mind as to the mode of inflicting the punishment of death upon persons of quality that decapitation had no influence on the fortunes of the family of the executed but that the punishment of the wheel was such an infamy that the uncles aunts brothers and sisters of the criminal and his whole family for three succeeding generations were excluded from all noble chapters princely abbeys sovereign bishoprics and even teutonic commanderies of the order of malta they showed how this would operate immediately upon the fortunes of a sister of the count who was on the point of being received as a canoness into one of the noble chapters while this scene was going on in the cabinet of the regent the illustrious assemblage of petitioners remained in the hall of council in the most gloomy state of suspense the re-entrance from the cabinet of the cardinal de rohan and the marquis de crequy with pale downcast countenances had struck a chill into every heart still they lingered until near midnight to learn the result of the after application at length the cabinet conference was at an end the regent came forth and saluted the high personages of the assemblage in a courtly manner one old lady of quality madame de guillon whom he had known in his infancy he kissed on the cheek calling her his good aunt he made a most ceremonious salutation to the stately marchioness de crequy telling her he was charmed to see her at the palais royal a compliment very ill-timed said the marchioness considering the circumstance which brought me there he then conducted the ladies to the door of the second saloon and there dismissed them with the most ceremonious politeness 
the application of the prince de Ligne and the duc de Rave for a change of the mode of punishment had after much difficulty been successful the regent had promised solemnly to send a letter of commutation to the attorney-general on holy monday the twenty fifth of march at five o'clock in the morning according to the same promise a scaffold would be arranged in the cloister of the conciergerie or prison where the count would be beheaded on the same morning immediately after having received absolution this mitigation of the form of punishment gave but little consolation to the great body of petitioners who had been anxious for the pardon of the youth it was looked upon as all-important however by the prince de Ligne, who as has been before observed was exquisitely alive to the dignity of his family the bishop of bayeux and the marquis de crequy visited the unfortunate youth in prison he had just received the communion in the chapel of the conciergerie and was kneeling before the altar listening to a mass for the dead which was performed at his request he protested his innocence of any intention to murder the jew but did not deign to allude to the accusation of robbery he made the bishop and the marquis promise to see his brother the prince and inform him of this his dying asseveration two other of his relations the prince rebecque montmorency and the marshal van eisenheim visited him secretly and offered him poison as a means of evading the disgrace of a public execution on his refusing to take it they left him with high indignation miserable man said they you are fit only to perish by the hand of the executioner the marquis de crequy sought the executioner of paris to bespeak an easy and decent death for the unfortunate youth do not make him suffer said he uncover no part of him but the neck and have his body placed in a coffin before you deliver it to his family the executioner promised all that was requested but declined a rouleau of a hundred louis d'or which the marquis would have put into his hand i am paid by the king for fulfilling my office said he and added that he had already refused a like sum offered by another relation of the marquis the marquis de crequy returned home in a state of deep affliction there he found a letter from the duc de saint simon the familiar friend of the regent repeating the promise of that prince that the punishment of the wheel should be commuted to decapitation imagine says the marchioness de crequy who in her memoirs gives a detailed account of this affair imagine what we experienced and what was our astonishment our grief and indignation when on tuesday the twenty sixth of march an hour after midday word was brought us that the count van horn had been exposed on the wheel in the place de greve since half past six in the morning on the same scaffold with the piemontese demi and that he had been tortured previous to execution one more scene of aristocratic pride closed this tragic story the marquis de crequy on receiving this astounding news immediately arrayed himself in the uniform of a general officer with his cordon of nobility on the coat he ordered six valets to attend him in grand livery and two of his carriages each with six horses to be brought forth in this sumptuous state he set off for the place de greve where he had been preceded by the prince de ligne de rohan de crouy and the duc de Havre. the count van horn was already dead and it was believed that the executioner had had the charity to give him the coup de grace or death blow at eight o'clock in the morning at five o'clock in the evening when the judge commissary left his post at the hotel de ville these noblemen with their own hands aided to detach the mutilated remains of their relation 
the marquis de crequy placed them in one of his carriages and bore them off to his hotel to receive the last sad obsequies the conduct of the regent in this affair excited general indignation his needless severity was attributed by some to vindictive jealousy by others to the persevering machinations of law and the abbe dubois the house of van horn and the high nobility of flanders and germany considered themselves flagrantly outraged many schemes of vengeance were talked of and a hatred engendered against the regent that followed him through life and was wreaked with bitterness upon his memory after his death the following letter is said to have been written to the regent by the prince van horn to whom the former had adjudged the confiscated effects of the count i do not complain sir of the death of my brother but i complain that your royal highness has violated in his person the rights of the kingdom the nobility and the nation i thank you for the confiscation of his effects but i should think myself as much disgraced as he should i accept any favour at your hands i hope that god and the king may render to you as strict justice as you have rendered to my unfortunate brother this audiobook is brought to you by full audiobooks please like subscribe and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks Section number 22 of Chronicles of Wolfert's Roost and Other Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Charlie Dykeman. I have heard of spirits walking with aerial bodies, and have wondered at by others. But I must only wonder at myself, for if they be not mad, I have come to my own burial. Shirley's Witty Fairy One Everybody has heard the fate of Don Juan, the famous libertine of Seville, who, for his sins against the fair sex and other minor picadillos, was hurried away to the infernal regions. His story has been illustrated in play, in pantomime, and farce, on every stage in Christendom, until at length it has been rendered the theme of the opera of operas and embalmed to endless duration in the glorious music of Mozart. I well recollect the effect of this story upon my feelings in my boyish days, the represented in grotesque pantomime, the awe with which I contemplated the monumental statue on horseback of the murdered commander, gleaming by pale moonlight in the convent cemetery how my heart quaked as he bowed his marble head and accepted the impious invitation of don juan how each footfall of the statue smote upon my heart as i heard it approach step by step through the echoing corridor and beheld it enter and advance a moving figure of stone to the supper table but then the convivial scene in the charnel house where don juan returned to the visit of the statue was offered a banquet of skulls and bones and on refusing to partake, was hurled into a yawning gulf under a tremendous shower of fire. These were accumulated horrors enough to shake the nerves of the most pantomime-loving schoolboy. Many have supposed the story of Don Juan a mere fable. I myself thought so once, but seeing is believing. I have since beheld the very scene where it took place, and now to indulge any doubt on the subject would be preposterous. I was one night perambulating the streets of Seville, in company with a Spanish friend, a curious investigator of the popular traditions and other good-for-nothing lore of the city, and who was kind enough to imagine he had met, in me, with a congenial spirit. In the course of our rambles, we were passing by a heavy dark gateway, opening into the courtyard of a convent where he laid his hand upon my arm. Stop, said he, this is the convent of San Francisco. There is a story connected with it, which I am sure must be known to you. You cannot but have heard of Don Juan and the marble statue. Undoubtedly, replied I, it has been familiar to me from childhood. Well, then, it was in the cemetery of this very convent that the events took place. Why, you do not mean to say that the story is founded on fact. 
Undoubtedly it is. The circumstances of the case are said to have occurred during the reign of Alfonso XI. Don Juan was of the noble family of Tenorio, one of the most illustrious houses of all Andalusia. His father, Don Diego Tenorio, was a favorite of the king, and his family ranked among the Cientenquatros, or magistrates of the city. Presuming on his high descent and powerful connections, Don Juan set no bounds to his excesses. No female, high or low, was sacred from his pursuit, and he soon became the scandal of Seville. One of his most daring outrages was to penetrate by night into the palaces of Don Gonzalo de Iloa, the commander of the Order of Calatrava, and attempt to carry off his daughter. The household was alarmed. A scuffle in the dark took place. Don Juan escaped, but the unfortunate commander was found weltering in his blood and expired without being able to name his murderer. Suspicions attached to Don Juan. He did not stop to meet the investigations of justice and the vengeance of the powerful family of Iloa, but fled from Seville and took refuge with his uncle, Don Pedro Tenorio, at the time ambassador at the court of Naples. Here, he remained until the investigation occasioned by the murder of Don Gonzalo had time to subside, and the scandal which the affair might cause to both the families of Oloa and Tenorio had induced them to hush it up. Don Juan, however, continued his libertine career at Naples, until at length his excesses forfeited the protection of his uncle the ambassador and obliged him again to flee. He had made his way back to Seville, trusting that his past misdeeds were forgotten, or rather trusting to his daredevil spirit and the power of his family to carry him through all difficulties. It was shortly after his return, and while in the height of his arrogance, that on visiting this very convent of Francisco, he beheld on a monument the equestrian statue of the murdered commander who had been buried within the walls of this sacred edifice where the family of Oloa had a chapel. It was on this occasion that Don Juan, in a moment of impious levity, invited the statue to the banquet, the awful catastrophe of which has been given such celebrity to his story. And pray how much of this story, said I, is believed in Seville. The whole of it, by the populace, with whom it has been a favorite tradition since time immemorial, and who crowd to the theaters to see it represented in dramas written long since by Tirso de Molina, another of our popular writers. Many in our higher ranks also, accustomed from childhood to this story, would feel somewhat indignant at hearing it treated with contempt. An attempt has been made to explain the whole by asserting that, to put an end to the extravagances of Don Juan and to pacify the family of Oloa, without exposing the delinquent to the degrading penalties of justice, he was decoyed into this convent under false pretext, and either plagued into a perpetual dungeon or privately hurried out of existence, while the story of the statue was circulated by the monks to account for his sudden disappearance. The populace, however, are not to be cajoled out of a ghost story by any of these plausible explanations, and the marble statue still strides the stage, and Don Juan is still plunged into the infernal regions as an awful warning to all rake helly youngsters in case offending. While my companion was relating these anecdotes, we had traversed the exterior courtyard of the convent and made our way into the great interior court, partly surrounded by cloisters and dormitories, partly by chapels, and having a large fountain in the center. The pile had evidently once been extensive and magnificent, but it was for the greater part in ruins. By the light of the stars and of twinkling lamps placed here and there in the chapels and corridors, I could see that many of the columns and arches were broken. The walls were rent and riven, while burnt beams and rafters showed the destructive effects of fire. The whole place had a desolate air, and the night breeze rustled through grass and weeds flaunting out of the crevices of the walls or from the shattered columns. The bat flitted about the vaulted passages, and the owl hooted from the ruined belfry. Never was any scene more completely fitted for a ghost story. While I was indulging in picturings of the fancy proper to such a place, the deep chant of the monks from the convent church came swelling upon the ear. It is the Vesper service, said my companion. Follow me. Leading the way across the court of the cloisters and through one or two ruined passages, he reached the portal of the church, and pushing open a wicket cut in the folding doors, we found ourselves in the deep, arched vestibule of the sacred edifice. To our left was the choir, forming one end of the church and having a low vaulted ceiling which gave it the look of a cavern. About this were ranged the monks, seated on stools and chanting from immense books, 
placed on music stands and having the notes scored in such gigantic characters as to be legible from every part of the choir. A few lights on these music stands dimly illuminated the choir, gleamed on the shaven heads of the monks and threw their shadows on the walls. They were gross, blue-bearded, bullet-headed men with bass voices of deep metallic tone that reverberated out of the cavernous choir. To our right extended the great body of the church. It was spacious and lofty. Some of the side chapels had gilded grates and were decorated with images and paintings representing the sufferings of our Savior. Aloft was a great painting by Murillo, but too much in the dark to be distinguished. The gloom of the whole church was but faintly relieved by the reflected light from the choir and the glimmering here and there of a votive lamp before the shrine of a saint. As my eye roamed about the shadowy pile, it was struck with the dimly seen figure of a man on horseback near a distant altar. I touched my companion. I pointed to it. The specter statue, said I. No, replied he. It is the statue of the blessed St. Iago. The statue of the commander was in the cemetery of the convent and was destroyed at the time of the conflagration. But, added he, as I see you take a proper interest in these kinds of stories, come with me to the other end of the church, where whisperings will not disturb these holy fathers at their devotions, and I will tell you another story that has been current for some generations in our city, but which you will find that Don Juan is not the only libertine that has been the object of supernatural castigation in Seville. I accordingly followed him with noiseless tread to the farther part of the church, where we took our seats on the steps of an altar opposite to the suspicious-looking figure on horseback, and there, in a low, mysterious voice, he related to me the following narrative. There was once in Seville a gay young fellow, Don Manuel de Menara by name, who, having come to a great estate by the death of his father, gave the reins to his passions and plunged into all kinds of dissipation. Like Don Juan, whom he seemed to have taken for a model, he became famous for his enterprises among the fair sex, and was the cause of doors being barred and windows grated with more than the usual strictness. All in vain. No balcony was too high for him to scale. No bolt nor bar was proof against his efforts, and his very name was a word of terror to all the jealous husbands and cautious fathers of Seville. His exploits extended to country as well as city, and in the village dependent on his castle, scarce was a rural beauty safe from his arts and enterprises. As he was one day ranging the streets of Seville with several of his dissolute companions, he beheld a procession about to enter the gate of a convent. In the center was a young female, Arrayed in the dress of a bride, it was a novice who, having accomplished her year of probation, was about to take the black veil and consecrate herself to heaven. The companions of Don Manuel drew back out of respect to the sacred pageant, but he pressed forward with his usual impetuosity to gain a near view of the novice. He almost jostled her in passing through the portal of the church when, on her turning round, he beheld the countenance of a beautiful village girl who had been the object of his ardent pursuit, but who had been spirited secretly out of his reach by her relatives. She recognized him at the same moment and fainted, but was born within the grade of the chapel. It was supposed that the agitation of the ceremony and the heat of the throng had overcome her. After some time, the curtain which hung within the grate was drawn up. There stood the novice, pale and trembling, surrounded by the abbess and the nuns. The ceremony proceeded, the crown of flowers was taken from her head, she was shorn of her silken tresses, received the black veil, and went passively through the remainder of the ceremony. Don Manuel de Manara, on the contrary, was roused to fury at the sight of this sacrifice. His passion, which had almost faded away in the absence of the object, now glowed with tenfold ardor, being inflamed by the difficulties placed in his way, and piqued by the measures which had been taken to defeat him. Never had the object of his pursuit appeared so lovely and desirable as when, within the grate of the convent, he and he swore to have her, in defiance of heaven and earth. By dint of bribing a female servant of the convent, he contrived to convey letters to her, pleading his passion in the most eloquent and seductive terms. How successful they were is only a matter of conjecture. Certain it is, he undertook one night to scale the garden wall of the convent, either to carry off the nun or gain admission to her cell. Just as he was mounting the wall, he was suddenly plucked back, and a stranger, muffled in a cloak, stood before him. "'Rash man, forbear!' cried he. 
Is it not enough to have violated all human ties? Wouldst thou steal a bride from heaven? The sword of Don Manuel had been drawn on the instant, and furious at this interruption, he passed it through the body of the stranger, who fell dead at his feet. Hearing approaching footsteps, he fled the fatal spot, and mounting his horse, which was at hand, retreated to his estate in the country, at no great distance from Seville. Here he remained throughout the next day, full of horror and remorse, dreading lest he should be known as the murder of the deceased, and fearing each moment the arrival of the officers of justice. The day had passed, however, without molestation, and as the evening advanced, unable any longer to endure the state of uncertainty and apprehension, he ventured back to Seville. Irresistibly, his footsteps took the direction of a convent, but he paused and hovered at a distance from the scene of blood. Several persons were gathered round the place, one of whom was busy nailing something against the convent wall. After a while they dispersed, and one passed near to Don Manuel. The latter addressed him with hesitating voice. Signor, said he, may I ask the reason of yonder throng? A cavalier, replied the other, has been murdered. Murdered? echoed Don Manuel, and can you tell me his name? Don Manuel de Menara, replied the stranger, and passed on. Don Manuel was startled at the mention of his own name, especially when applied to the murdered man. He ventured, when it was entirely deserted, to approach the fatal spot. A small cross had been nailed against the wall, as is customary in Spain to mark the place where a murder has been committed, and just below it, he read, by the twinkling light of a lamp, here was murdered Don Manuel de Manara, play to God for his soul. Still more confounded and perplexed by this inscription, he wandered about the streets until the night was far advanced, and all was still and lonely. As he entered the principal square, the light of torches suddenly broke on him, and he beheld a grand funeral procession moving across it. There was a train of priests, and many persons of dignified appearance in ancient Spanish dresses, attending his mourners, none of whom he knew. Accosting a servant who followed in the train, he demanded the name of the defunct. Don Manuel de Manara was the reply, and it went cold to his heart. He looked, and indeed beheld the armorial bearings of his family emblazoned on the funeral escutcheons. Yet not one of his family was to be seen among the mourners. The mystery was more and more incomprehensible. He followed the procession as it moved on to the cathedral. The bier was deposited before the high altar. The funeral service was commenced, and the grand organ began to peal through the vaulted aisles. Again the youth ventured to question this awful pageant. Father, said he, with trembling voice to one of the priests, who is this you are about to inter? Don Manuel de Menara, replied the priest. Father, cried Don Manuel, impatiently, you are deceived. This is some imposture. Know that Don Manuel de Manara is alive and well, and now stands before you. I am Don Manuel de Manara. Avant, rash youth, cried the priest. Know that Don Manuel de Manara is dead, is dead, is dead, and we are all souls from his purgatory, his deceased relatives and ancestors, and others that have been aided by masses from his family who are permitted to come here and pray for the repose of his soul. Don Manuel cast round a fearful glance upon the assemblage in antiquated Spanish garbs and recognized in their pale and ghastly countenances the portraits of many an ancestor that hung in his family picture gallery. He now lost all self-command, rushed up to the bier, and beheld the counterpart of himself, but in the fixed and livid lineaments of death. Just at that moment, the whole choir burst forth with a requiescat in pace that shook the vaults of the cathedral. Don Manuel sank senseless on the pavement. He was found there early the next morning by the sacristan and conveyed to his home. When sufficiently recovered, he sent for a friar, made a full confession of all that had happened. My son, said the friar, all this is a miracle and a mystery intended for thy conversion and salvation. The corpse thou hast seen was a token that thou hadst died to sin and the world. Take warning by it and henceforth live to righteousness in heaven. Don Manuel did take warning by it. Guided by the counsels of the worthy friar, he disposed of all his temporal affairs, dedicated the greater part of his wealth to pious uses, especially to the performance of masses for souls in purgatory, and finally, entering a convent, became one of the most zealous and exemplary monks in Seville. 
While my companion was relating this story, my eyes wandered from time to time about the dusky church. Methought the burly countenances of the monks in the distant choir assumed a pallid, ghastly hue, and their deep, metallic voices a sepulchral sound. By the time the story was ended, they had ended their chant, and, extinguishing their lights, glided one by one, like shadows, through a small door in the side of the choir. A deeper gloom prevailed over the church. The figure opposite me on horseback grew more and more spectral, and I almost expected to see it bow its head. It is time to be off, said my companion, unless we intend to sup with the statue. I have no relish for such fare, nor such company, replied I, and following my companion we groped our way through the moldering cloisters. As we passed by the ruined cemetery, keeping up a casual conversation by way of dispelling the loneliness of the scene, I called to mind the words of the poet. The tombs and monumental caves of death look cold, and shoot a chillness to my trembling heart. Give me thy hand, let me hear thy voice. Nay, speak, and let me hear thy voice. Mine own affrights me with its echoes. There wanted nothing but the marble statue of the commander, striding along the echoing cloisters to complete the haunted scene. Since that time, I never fail to attend the theater whenever the story of Don Juan is represented, whether in pantomime or opera. In the sepulchral scene, I feel myself quite at home. And when the statue makes his appearance, I greet him as an old acquaintance. When the audience applaud, I look round upon them with a degree of compassion. Poor souls, I say to myself. They think they are pleased, they think they enjoy this piece, and yet they consider the whole as a fiction. How much more would they enjoy it if, like me, they knew it to be true, and had seen the very place? End of section number 22. Section 23 of Wolfert's Roost and Other Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. Chronicles of Wolfert's Roost and Other Papers by Washington Irving. Legend of the Engulfed Convent. At the dark and melancholy period when Don Roderick the Goth and his chivalry were overthrown on the banks of the Guadalete, and all Spain was overrun by the Moors, great was the devastation of churches and convents throughout that pious kingdom. The miraculous fate of one of those holy piles is thus recorded in an authentic legend of those days. On the summit of a hill, not very distant from the capital city of Toledo, stood an ancient convent and chapel, dedicated to the invocation of St. Benedict and inhabited by a sisterhood of Benedictine nuns. This holy asylum was confined to females of noble lineage. The younger sisters of the highest families were here given in religious marriage to their Savior, in order that the portions of their elder sisters might be increased, and they enabled to make suitable matches on earth, or that the family wealth might go undivided to elder brothers, and the dignity of their ancient houses be protected from decay. The convent was renowned, therefore, for enshrining within its walls a sisterhood of the purest blood, the most immaculate virtue, and most resplendent beauty of all Gothic Spain. When the Moors overran the kingdom, there was nothing that more excited their hostility than these virgin asylums. The very sight of a convent spire was sufficient to set their Moslem blood in a foment, and they sacked it with as fierce a zeal as though the sacking of a nunnery were a sure passport to Elysium. Tidings of such outrages committed in various parts of the kingdom reached this noble sanctuary and filled it with dismay. The danger came nearer and nearer. The infidel hosts were spreading all over the country. Toledo itself was captured. There was no flying from the convent and no security within its walls. In the midst of this agitation, the alarm was given one day that a great band of Saracens were spurring across the plain. In an instant, the whole convent was a scene of confusion. Some of the nuns wrung their fair hands at the windows, others waved their veils and uttered shrieks from the tops of the towers, vainly hoping to draw relief from a country overrun by the foe. The sight of these innocent doves thus fluttering about their dovecoat but increased the zealot fury of the whiskered moors. They thundered at the portal, and at every blow the ponderous gates trembled on their hinges. The nuns now crowded round the abbess, 
They had been accustomed to look up to her as all-powerful, and they now implored her protection. The mother abbess looked with a rueful eye upon the treasures of beauty and vestal virtue exposed to such imminent peril. Alas, how was she to protect them from the spoiler? She had, it is true, experienced many signal interpositions of providence in her individual favor. Her early days had been passed amid the temptations of a court, where her virtue had been purified by repeated trials, from none of which had she escaped but by miracle. But were miracles never to cease? Could she hope that the marvelous protection shown to herself would be extended to a whole sisterhood? There was no other resource. The Moors were at the threshold. A few moments more, and the convent would be at their mercy. Summoning her nuns to follow her, she hurried into the chapel, and throwing herself on her knees before the image of the Blessed Mary, "'O oh, holy lady!' exclaimed she. "'O oh, most pure and immaculate of virgins! Thou seest our extremity! The ravager is at the gate, and there is none on earth to help us. Look down with pity, and grant that the earth may gape and swallow us, rather than that our cloister vows should suffer violation.' The Moors redoubled their assault upon the portal. The gates gave way with a tremendous crash. A savage yell of exultation arose. When of a sudden the earth yawned, down sank the convent with its cloisters, its dormitories, and all its nuns. The chapel tower was the last that sank, the bell ringing forth a peal of triumph in the very teeth of the infidels. Forty years had passed and gone since the period of this miracle. The subjugation of Spain was complete. The Moors lorded it over city and country, and such of the Christian population as remained and were permitted to exercise their religion did it in humble resignation to the Moslem sway. At this time a Christian cavalier of Cordova, hearing that a patriotic band of his countrymen had raised the standard of the cross in the mountains of Asturias, resolved to join them and unite in breaking the yoke of bondage. Secretly arming himself and caparisoning his steed, he set forth from Cordova, and pursued his course by unfrequented mule paths and along the dry channels made by winter torrents. His spirit burned with indignation whenever, on commanding a view over a long sweeping plain, he beheld the mosque swelling in the distance and the Arab horsemen careering about as if the rightful lords of the soil. Many a deep-drawn sigh and heavy groan also did the good cavalier utter on passing the ruins of churches and convents desolated by the conquerors. It was on a sultry midsummer evening that this wandering cavalier, in skirting a hill thickly covered with forest, heard the faint tones of a vesper bell sounding melodiously in the air and seeming to come from the summit of the hill. The cavalier crossed himself with wonder at this unwanted and Christian sound. He supposed it to proceed from one of those humble chapels and hermitages permitted to exist through the indulgence of the Moslem conquerors. Turning his steed up a narrow path of the forest, he sought this sanctuary, in hopes of finding a hospitable shelter for the night. As he advanced, the trees threw a deep gloom around him, and the bat flitted across his path. The bell ceased to toll, and all was silence. Presently a choir of female voices came stealing sweetly through the forest, chanting the evening service to the solemn accompaniment of an organ. The heart of the good cavalier melted at the sound, for it recalled the happier days of his country. Urging forward his weary steed, he at length arrived at a broad, grassy area on the summit of the hill, surrounded by the forest. Here the melodious voices rose in full chorus, like the swelling of the breeze, but whence they came he could not tell. Sometimes they were before, sometimes behind him, sometimes in the air, sometimes as if from within the bosom of the earth. At length they died away, and a holy stillness settled on the place. The cavalier gazed around with bewildered eye. There was neither chapel nor convent nor humble hermitage to be seen, nothing but a moss-grown stone pinnacle rising out of the center of the area, surmounted by a cross. The green sward appeared to have been sacred from the tread of man or beast, and the surrounding trees bent toward the cross as if in adoration. The cavalier felt a sensation of holy awe. He alighted and tethered his steed on the skirts of the forest, where he might crop the tender herbage. Then approaching the cross, he knelt and poured forth his evening prayers before this relic of the Christian days of Spain. His orisons being concluded, he laid himself down at the foot of the pinnacle, and reclining his head against one of its stones, fell into a deep sleep. 
About midnight he was awakened by the tolling of a bell, and found himself lying before the gate of an ancient convent. A train of nuns passed by, each bearing a taper. He rose and followed them into the chapel. In the center was a bier, on which lay the corpse of an aged nun. The organ performed a solemn requiem, the nuns joining in chorus. When the funeral service was finished, a melodious voice chanted, Requiescat in pace. May she rest in peace. The lights immediately vanished. The whole passed away as a dream, and the cavalier found himself at the foot of the cross, and beheld by the faint rays of the rising moon his steed quietly grazing near him. When the day dawned, he descended the hill, and following the course of a small brook came to a cave, at the entrance of which was seated an ancient man in hermit's garb, with rosary and cross and a beard that descended to his girdle. He was one of those holy anchorites permitted by the Moors to live unmolested in the dens and caves and humble hermitages, and even to practice the rites of their religion. The cavalier, dismounting, knelt and craved a benediction. He then related all that had befallen him in the night, and besought the hermit to explain the mystery. "'What thou hast heard and seen, my son,' replied the other, "'is but a type and shadow of the woes of Spain.' He then related the foregoing story of the miraculous delivery of the convent. Forty years, added the holy man, have elapsed since this event, yet the bells of that sacred edifice are still heard, from time to time, sounding from underground, together with the pealing of the organ and the chanting of the choir. The moors avoid this neighborhood as haunted ground, and the whole place, as thou mayest perceive, has become covered with a thick and lonely forest." The cavalier listened with wonder to the story. For three days and nights did he keep vigils with the holy man beside the cross. But nothing more was to be seen of nun or convent. It is supposed that forty years having elapsed, the natural lives of all the nuns were finished, and the cavalier had beheld the obsequies of the last. Certain it is that from that time, bell and organ and choral chant have never more been heard. The moldering pinnacle surmounted by the cross remains an object of pious pilgrimage, some say that it anciently stood in front of the convent, but others that it was the spire which remained above ground, when the main body of the building sank like the topmast of some tall ship that has foundered. These pious believers maintain that the convent is miraculously preserved entire in the center of the mountain, where, if proper excavations were made, it would be found with all its treasures and monuments and shrines and relics and the tombs of its virgin nuns. Should any one doubt the truth of this marvelous interposition of the Virgin to protect the vestal purity of her votaries, let him read the excellent work entitled Espana Triumphante, written by Fray Antonio de Santa Maria, a barefoot friar of the Carmelite order, and he will doubt no longer. End of section 23. Section 24 of The Chronicles of Wolfert Roost. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Tucker. Chronicles of Wolfert's Roost by Washington Irving. The Phantom Island. Break, fancy, from thy cave of cloud, and wave thy purple wings. Now all thy figures are allowed, and various shapes of things. Creative, airy forms a stream. It must have blood and not of phlegm, and though it be a walking dream, yet let it, like an odor, rise to all the senses here, and fall like sleep upon their eyes, or music on their ear. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in our philosophy, and among these may be placed that marvel and mystery of the seas, the island of St. Brandon. Those who have read the history of the Canaries, the fortunate islands of the ancients, may remember the wonders told of this enigmatical island. Occasionally it would be visible from their shores. Stretching away in the clear, bright west, to all appearance substantial like themselves, and still more beautiful. Expeditions would launch forth from the Canaries to explore this land of promise. For a time, its sun-gilt peaks and long, shadowy promontories would remain distinctly visible, but in proportion as the voyagers approached, peak and promontory would 
gradually fade away until nothing would remain but blue sky above and deep blue water below. Hence this mysterious isle was stigmatized by ancient cosmographers with the name of Aprocytus, or the Inaccessible, the failure of numerous expeditions sent in quest of it, both in ancient and modern days, have at length caused its very existence to be called in question, and it has been rashly pronounced a mere optical illusion, like the Fata Morgana of the Straits of Messina, or has been classed with those unsubstantial regions known to mariners as Cape Flyaway and the coast of Cloudland. Let us not permit, however, the doubts of worldly-wise skeptics to rob us of all the glorious realms owned by happy credulity in days of yore. Be assured, O reader of easy faith, thou for whom it is my delight to labor, be assured that such an island actually exists, and has from time to time been revealed to the gaze and trodden by the feet of favored mortals. Historians and philosophers may have their doubts, but its existence has been fully attested by that inspired race, the poets, who, being gifted with a kind of second sight, are enabled to discern those mysteries of nature hidden from the eyes of ordinary men. To this gifted race it has ever been a kind of wonderland. Here once bloomed, and perhaps still blooms, the famous garden of the Hesperides, with its golden fruit. Here too the sorceress Armida had her enchanted garden, in which she held the Christian paladin Rinaldo in delicious but inglorious thraldom, as set forth in the immortal Lay of Tasso. It was in this island that Sycorax the witch held sway, while the good Prospero and his infant daughter Miranda were wafted to its shores. Who does not know the tale as told in the magic page of Shakespeare? The island was then full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. The island, in fact at different times, has been under the sway of different powers, genii of earth and air and ocean, who have made it their shadowy abode. Hither have retired many classic but broken-down deities, shorn of almost all their attributes, but who once ruled the poetic world. Here Neptune and Amphitrite hold a diminished court, sovereigns in exile. Their ocean chariot, almost a wreck, lies bottom upward in some sea-beaten cavern. Their Percy Tritons and haggard Nereids bask listlessly like seals about the rocks. Sometimes those deities assume, it is said, a shadow of their ancient pomp, and glide in state about a summer sea. And then, as some tall India man lies becalmed with idly flapping sail, her drowsy crew may hear the mellow note of the triton's shell swelling upon the ear as the invisible pageant sweeps by. On the shores of this wondrous isle, the kraken heaves its unwieldy bulk and wallows many a rood. Here the sea serpent, that mighty but much contested reptile, lies coiled up during the intervals of its revelations to the eyes of true believers. Here even the flying Dutchman finds a port, and casts his anchor, and furls his shadowy sail and takes a brief repose from his eternal cruisings. In the deep bays and harbors of the island lies many a spellbound ship, long since given up as lost by the ruined merchant. Here, too, its crew, long, long bewailed in vain, lie sleeping from age to age in mossy grottoes, or wander about in pleasing oblivion of all things. Here in caverns are garnered up the priceless treasures lost in the ocean, here sparkles in vain the diamond, and flames the carbuncle. Here are piled up rich bales of oriental silks, boxes of pearls, and piles of golden ingots. Such are some of the marvels related of this island, which may serve to throw light upon the following legend of unquestionable truth, which I recommend to the implicit belief of the reader. The Adelantado of the Seven Cities, A Legend of St. Brandon in the early part of the fifteenth century, when Prince Henry of Portugal, of worthy memory, was pushing the career of discovery along the western coast of Africa, and the world was resounding with reports of golden regions on the mainland and new-found islands in the ocean, there arrived at Lisbon an old bewildered pilot of the seas, who had been driven by tempests, he knew not whither, and raved about an island far in the deep, upon which he had landed, and which he had found peopled with Christians and adorned with noble cities. 
The inhabitants, he said, having never before been visited by a ship, gathered round and regarded him with surprise. They told him they were descendants of a band of Christians, who fled from Spain when that country was conquered by the Moslems. They were curious about the state of their fatherland, and grieved to hear that the Moslems still held possession of the kingdom of Granada. They would have taken the old navigator to church to convince him of their orthodoxy, but either through lack of devotion or lack of faith in their words, he declined their invitation and preferred to return on board of his ship. He was properly punished. A furious storm arose, drove him from his anchorage, hurried him out to sea, and he saw no more of the unknown island. This strange story caused great marvel in Lisbon and elsewhere. Those versed in history remembered to have read in an ancient chronicle that, at the time of the conquest of Spain in the 8th century, when the Blessed Cross was east down and the crescent erected in its place, and when Christian churches were turned into Moslem mosques, seven bishops at the head of seven bands of pious exiles had fled from the peninsula and embarked in quest of some ocean island or distant land where they might found seven Christian cities and enjoy their faith unmolested. The fate of these saints errant had hitherto remained a mystery, and their story had faded from memory. The report of the old tempest-tossed pilot, however, revived this long-forgotten theme, and it was determined by the pious and enthusiastic that the island thus accidentally discovered was the identical place of refuge whither the wandering bishops had been guided by a protecting providence, and where, they had folded their flocks. This most excitable of worlds has always some darling object of chimerical enterprise. The island of the seven cities, now awakened as much interest and longing among zealous Christians as has the renowned city of Timbuktu among adventurous travellers, or the northeast passage among hardy navigators. And it was a frequent prayer of the devout, that these scattered and lost portions of the Christian family might be discovered and reunited to the great body of Christendom. No one, however, entered into the matter with half the zeal of Don Fernando de Olmo, a young cavalier of high standing in the Portuguese court, and of most sanguine and romantic temperament. He had recently come to his estate, and had run the round of all kinds of pleasures and excitements, when this new theme of popular talk and wonder presented itself. The island of the Seven Cities became now the constant subject of his thoughts by day, and his dreams by night. It even rivaled his passion for a beautiful girl, one of the greatest belles of Lisbon, to whom he was betrothed. At length his imagination became so inflamed on the subject that he determined to fit out an expedition at his own expense, and set sail in quest of this sainted island. It could not be a cruise of any great extent, for, according to the calculations of the tempest-tossed pilot, it must be somewhere in the latitude of the Canaries, which at that time, when the New World was as yet undiscovered, formed the frontier of ocean enterprise. Don Fernando applied to the crown for countenance and protection. As he was a favorite at court, the usual patronage was readily extended to him. That is to say, he received a commission from the king, Don Iom II, constituting him adelantado, or military governor, of any country he might discover, with the single proviso that he should bear all the expenses of the discovery, and pay a tenth of the profits to the crown. Don Fernando now set to work in the true spirit of a projector. He sold acre after acre of solid land, and invested the proceeds in ships, guns, ammunition, and sea stores. Even his old family mansion in Lisbon was mortgaged without scruple, for he looked forward to a palace in one of the seven cities of which he was to be adelantado. This was the age of nautical romance, when the thoughts of all speculative dreamers were turned to the ocean. The scheme of Don Fernando, therefore, drew adventurers of every kind. The merchant promised himself new marts of opulent traffic. The soldier hoped to sack and plunder some one or other of those seven cities. Even the fat monk shook off the sleep and sloth of the cloister, to join in a crusade which promised such increase to the possessions of the church. One person alone regarded the whole project with sovereign contempt and growling hostility. This was Don Romero Alvarez, the father of the beautiful Serafina, to whom Don Fernando was betrothed. He was one of those perverse, matter-of-fact old men who are prone to oppose everything speculative and romantic. 
He had no faith in the island of the Seven Cities, regarded the projected cruise as a crack-brained freak, looked with angry eye and internal heart-burning on the conduct of his intended son-in-law, chaffering away solid lands for lands in the moon, and scofflingly dubbed him Adelantado of Cloudland. In fact, he had never really relished the intended match, to which his consent had been slowly extorted by the tears and entreaties of his daughter. It is true he could have no reasonable objections to the youth, for Don Fernando was the very flower of Portuguese chivalry. No one could excel him at the tilting match or the riding at the ring. None was more bold and dexterous in the bullfight. None composed more gallant madrigals in praise of his lady's charms, or sang them with sweeter tones to the accompaniment of her guitar. Nor could any one handle the castanets and dance the bolero with more captivating grace. All these admirable qualities and endowments, however, though they had been sufficient to win the heart of Serafina, were nothing in the eyes of her unreasonable father. O oh, Cupid, god of love, why will fathers always be so unreasonable? The engagement to Serafina had threatened at first to throw an obstacle in the way of the expedition of Don Fernando, and for a time perplexed him in the extreme. He was passionately attached to the young lady, but he was also passionately bent on this romantic enterprise. How should he reconcile the two passionate inclinations? A simple and obvious arrangement at length presented itself. Marry Serafina, enjoy a portion of the honeymoon at once, and defer the rest until his return from the discovery of the seven cities. He hastened to make known this most excellent arrangement to Don Ramiro, when the long-smothered wrath of the old cavalier burst forth. He reproached him with being the dupe of wandering vagabonds and wild schemers, and with squandering all his real possessions in pursuit of empty bubbles. Don Fernando was too sanguine a projector, and too young a man, to listen tamely to such language. He acted with what is technically called becoming spirit. A high quarrel ensued. Don Romero pronounced him a madman, and forbade all farther intercourse with his daughter until he should give proof of returning sanity by abandoning this madcap enterprise. While Don Fernando flung out of the house, more bent than ever on the expedition from the idea of triumphing over the incredulity of the greybeard when he should return successful. Don Romero's heart misgave him. Who knows, thought he, but this crack-brained visionary may persuade my daughter to elope with him, and share his throne in this unknown paradise of fools. If I could only keep her safe until his ships are fairly out at sea. He repaired to her apartment, represented to her the sanguine, unstudy character of her lover and the chimerical value of his schemes, and urged the propriety of suspending all intercourse with him until he should recover from his present hallucination. She bowed her head as if in filial acquiescence, whereupon he folded her to his bosom with parental fondness and kissed away a tear that was stealing over her cheek. But as he left the chamber, quietly turned the key on the lock. For though he was a fond father, and had a high opinion of the submissive temper of his child, he had a still higher opinion of the conservative virtues of lock and key, and determined to trust to them until the caravels should sail. Whether the damsel had been any wise shaken in her faith as to the schemes of her lover by her father's eloquence, tradition does not say. But certain it is that the moment she heard the key turn in the lock, she became a firm believer in the island of the seven cities. The door was locked, but her will was unconfined. A window of the chamber opened into one of those stone balconies secured by iron bars which projected like huge cages from Portuguese and Spanish houses. Within this balcony the beautiful Serafina had her birds and flowers, and here she was accustomed to sit on moonlight nights as in a bower and touch her guitar and sing like a wakeful nightingale. From this balcony an intercourse was now maintained between the lovers, against which the lock and key of Don Ramiro were of no avail. All day would Fernando be occupied hurrying the equipments of his ships, but evening found him in sweet discourse beneath his lady's window. At length the preparations were completed. Two gallant caravels lay at anchor in the Tagus ready to sail at sunrise. Late at night by the pale light of a waning moon, the lover had his last interview. The beautiful Serafina was sad at heart, and full of dark forebodings. Her lover full of hope and confidence. A few short months, said he, and I shall return in triumph. Thy father will then blush at his incredulity, 
and hastened to welcome to his house the adelantado of the seven cities. The gentle lady shook her head. It was not on this point she felt distrust. She was a thorough believer in the island of the seven cities, and so sure of the success of the enterprise that she might have been tempted to join it had not the balcony been high and the grating strong. Other considerations induced that dubious shaking of the head. She had heard of the inconstancy of the seas, and the inconstancy of those who roamed them. Might not Fernando meet with other loves in foreign ports? Might not some peerless beauty in one or other of those seven cities efface the image of Serafina from his mind? Now, let the truth be spoken. The beautiful Serafina had reason for her disquiet. If Don Fernando had any fault in the world, it was that of being rather inflammable and apt to take fire from every sparkling eye. He had been somewhat of a rover among the sex on shore. What might he be on sea? She ventured to express her doubt, but he spurned at the very idea. What? He faults to Serafina? He bow at the shrine of another beauty? Never, never! Repeatedly did he bend his knee and smite his breast, and call upon the silver moon to witness his sincerity and truth. He retorted the doubt. Might not Serafina herself forget her plighted faith? Might not some wealthier rival present himself while he was tossing on the sea, and backed by her father's wishes, win the treasure of her hand? The beautiful Serafina raised her white arms between the iron bars of the balcony, and, like her lover, invoked the moon to testify her vows. Alas, how little did Fernando know her heart! The more her father should oppose, the more would she be fixed in faith. Though years should intervene, Fernando on his return would find her true. Even should the salt sea swallow him up, and her eyes shed salt tears at the very thought, never would she be the wife of another. Never, never, never. She drew from her finger a ring gemmed with a ruby heart, and dropped it from the balcony, a parting pledge of constancy. Thus the lovers parted with many a tender word and plighted vow. But will they keep those vows? Perish the doubt. Have they not called the constant moon to witness? With the morning dawn, the caravels dropped down the Tagus and put to sea. They steered for the Canaries, in those days the regions of nautical discovery and romance, and the outposts of the known world. For as yet Columbus had not steered his daring barks across the ocean. Scarce had they reached those latitudes when they were separated by a violent tempest. For many days was the caravel of Don Fernando driven about at the mercy of the elements. All seamanship was baffled, destruction seemed inevitable, and the crew were in despair. All at once the storm subsided, the ocean sank into a calm. The clouds which had veiled the face of heaven were suddenly withdrawn, and the tempest tossed mariners beheld a fair and mountainous island, emerging as if by enchantment from the murky gloom. They rubbed their eyes and gazed for a time almost incredulously. Yet there lay the island, spread out in lovely landscapes with the late stormy sea, laving its shores with peaceful billows. The pilot of the caravel consulted his maps and charts. No island like the one before him was laid down as existing in those parts. It is true, he had lost his reckoning in the late storm, but, according to his calculations, he could not be far from the Canaries. And this was not one of that group of islands. The caravel now lay perfectly becalmed off the mouth of a river, on the banks of which, about a league from the sea, was descried a noble city, with lofty walls and towers, and a protecting castle. After a time, a stately barge with sixteen oars was seen emerging from the river and approaching the caravel. It was quaintly carved and gilt. The oarsmen were clad in antique garb, their oars painted of a bright crimson, and they came slowly and solemnly, keeping time as they rowed to the cadence of an old Spanish ditty. Under a silken canopy in the stern sat a cavalier richly clad, and over his head was a banner bearing the sacred emblem of the cross. When the barge reached the caravel, the cavalier stepped on board. He was tall and gaunt, with a long Spanish visage, mustaches that curled up to his eyes, and a forked beard. He wore gauntlets reaching to his elbows, a Toledo blade strutting out behind with a basket hilt in which he carried his handkerchief. His air was lofty and precise, and bespoke indisputably the Hidalgo. Thrusting out a long spindle leg, he took off a huge sombrero 
and swaying it until the feathers swept the ground, accosted Don Fernando in the old Castilian language, and with the old Castilian courtesy, welcoming him to the island of the seven cities. Don Fernando was overwhelmed with astonishment. Could this be true? Had he really been tempest-driven to the very land of which he was in quest? It was even so. That very day the inhabitants were holding high festival in commemoration of the escape of their ancestors from the Moors. The arrival of the caravel at such a juncture was considered a good omen, the accomplishment of an ancient prophecy through which the island was to be restored to the great community of Christendom. The cavalier before him was Grand Chamberlain, sent by the Alcade to invite him to the festivities of the capital. Don Fernando could scarcely believe that this was not all a dream. He made known his name and the object of his voyage. The Grand Chamberlain declared that all was in perfect accordance with the ancient prophecy, and that the moment his credentials were presented, he would be acknowledged as the Adelantado of the Seven Cities. In the meantime the day was waning. The barge was ready to convey him to the land, and would as assuredly bring him back. Don Fernando's pilot, a veteran of the seas, drew him aside and expostulated against his venturing, on the mere word of a stranger, to land in a strange barge on an unknown shore. Who knows, senor, what land this is, or what people inhabit it? Don Fernando was not to be dissuaded. Had he not believed in this island when all the world doubted? Had he not sought it in defiance of storm and tempest, and was he now to shrink from its shores, when they lay before him in calm weather? In a word, was not faith the very cornerstone of his enterprise? Having arrayed himself, therefore, in gala dress, befitting the occasion, he took his seat in the barge. The Grand Chamberlain seated himself opposite. The rowers plied their oars, and renewed the mournful old ditty, and the gorgeous but unwieldy barge moved slowly through the water. The night closed in before they entered the river, and swept along past rock and promontory, each guarded by its tower. At every post they were challenged by the sentinel. "'Who goes there?' The Adelantado of the Seven Cities. Welcome, Senor Adelantado. Pass on. Entering the harbor, they rode close by an armed galley of ancient form. Soldiers with crossbows patrolled the deck. Who goes there? The Adelantado of the Seven Cities. Welcome, Senor Adelantado. Pass on. They landed at a broad flight of stone steps, leading up between two massive towers, and knocked at the water gate. A sentinel, in an ancient steel cask, looked from the barbican. "'Who is there?' "'The Adelantado of the Seven Cities.' "'Welcome, Signor Adelantado.' The gate swung open, grating upon rusty hinges. They entered between two rows of warriors in Gothic armor with crossbows, maces, battle-axes, and faces old-fashioned as their armor. There were processions through the streets, in commemoration of the landing of the seven bishops and their followers— and bonfires, at which effigies of lossal moors expiated their invasion of Christendom by a kind of auto da fe. The groups round the fires, uncouth in their attire, looked like the fantastic figures that roamed the streets in carnival time. Even the dames who gazed down from Gothic balconies hung with antique tapestry resembled effigies dressed up in Christmas mummeries. Everything, in short, bore the stamp of former ages, as if the world had suddenly rolled back for several centuries. Nor was this to be wondered at. Had not the island of the seven cities been cut off from the rest of the world for several hundred years? And were not these the modes and customs of Gothic Spain before it was conquered by the Moors? Arrived at the palace of the Alcade, the Grand Chamberlain knocked at the portal. The porter looked through a wicket and demanded who was there. The Adelantado of the seven cities. The portal was thrown wide open. The Grand Chamberlain led the way up a vast, heavily molded marble staircase and into a hall of ceremony, where was the alcade with several of the principal dignitaries of the city, who had a marvelous resemblance in form and feature to the quaint figures in old illuminated manuscripts. The Grand Chamberlain stepped forward and announced the name and title of the stranger guest, and the extraordinary nature of his mission. The announcement appeared to create no extraordinary emotion or surprise, but to be received as the anticipated fulfillment of a prophecy. The reception of Don Fernando, however, was profoundly gracious, though in the same style of stately courtesy which everywhere prevailed. 
He would have produced his credentials, but this was courteously declined. The evening was devoted to high festivity. The following day, when he should enter the port with his caravel, would be devoted to business, when the credentials would be received in due form, and he inducted into office as Adelantado of the Seven Cities. Don Fernando was now conducted through one of those interminable suits of apartments, the pride of Spanish palaces all furnished in a style of obsolete magnificence. In a vast saloon, blazing with tapers, was assembled all the aristocracy and fashion of the city. Stately dames and cavaliers, the very counterpart of the figures in the tapestry which decorated the walls. Fernando gazed in silent marvel. It was a reflex of the proud aristocracy of Spain in the time of Roderick the Goth. The festivities of the evening were all in the style of solemn and antiquated ceremonial. There was a dance, but it was as if the old tapestry were put in motion, and all the figures moving in stately measure about the floor. There was one exception, and one that told powerfully upon the susceptible Adelantado, the Alcade's daughter. Such a ripe, melting beauty! Her dress, it is true, like the dresses of her neighbors, might have been worn before the flood. But she had the black Andalusian eye, a glance of which, through its long dark lashes, is irresistible. Her voice, too, her manner, her undulating movements, all smacked of Andalusia, and showed how female charms may be transmitted from age to age and clime to clime, without ever going out of fashion. Those who know the witchery of the sex in that amorous part of amorous old Spain may judge of the fascination to which Don Fernando was exposed as he joined in the dance with one of its most captivating descendants. He sat beside her at the banquet, such an old-world feast, such obsolete dainties, at the head of the table of the peacock, that bird of state and ceremony was served up in full plumage on a golden dish. As Don Fernando cast his eyes down the glittering board, what a vista presented itself of odd heads and headdresses. Of formal bearded dignitaries and stately dames, with castellated locks and towering plumes. Is it to be wondered at that he should turn with delight from these antiquated figures to the Alcade's daughter? All smiles and dimples and melting looks and melting accents. Besides, for I wish to give him every excuse in my power, he was in a particularly excitable mood from the novelty of the scene before him. From this realization of all his hopes and fancies, and from frequent draughts of the wine-cup presented to him at every moment by officious pages during the banquet. In a word, there is no concealing the matter. Before the evening was over, Don Fernando was making love outright to the Alcade's daughter. They had wandered together to a moonlit balcony of the palace, and he was charming her ear with one of those love ditties with which, in a like balcony, he had serenaded the beautiful Serafina. The damsel hung her head coyly. Ah, signor, these are flattering words, but you cavaliers who roam the seas are unsteady as its waves. Tomorrow you will be throned in state, adelantado of the seven cities, and will think no more of the Alcade's daughter. Don Fernando, in the intoxication of the moment, called the moon to witness his sincerity. As he raised his hand in adjuration, the chaste moon cast a ray upon the ring that sparkled on his finger. It caught the damsel's eye. Signor Adelantado? said she archly. I have no great faith in the moon, but give me that ring upon your finger in pledge of the truth of what you profess. The gallant Adelantado was taken by surprise. There was no parrying this sudden appeal. Before he had time to reflect, the ring of the beautiful Serafina glittered on the finger of the Alcade's daughter. At this eventful moment the Chamberlain approached with lofty demeanor, and announced that the barge was waiting to bear him back to the caravel. I forbear to relate the ceremonious partings with the Alcade and his dignitaries, and the tender farewell of the Alcade's daughter. He took his seat in the barge opposite the Grand Chamberlain. The rowers plied their crimson oars in the same slow and stately manner to the cadence of the same mournful old ditty. His brain was in a whirl with all that he had seen, and his heart now and then gave him a twinge as he thought of his temporary infidelity to the beautiful Serafina. The barge sallied out into the sea, but no caravel was to be seen. Doubtless she had been carried to a distance by the current of the river. The oarsmen rowed on. Their monotonous chant had a lulling effect. A drowsy influence crept over Don Fernando. 
Objects swam before his eyes. The oarsman assumed odd shapes as in a dream. The Grand Chamberlain grew larger and larger and taller and taller. He took off his huge sombrero and held it over the head of Don Fernando, like an extinguisher over a candle. The latter cowered beneath it. He felt himself sinking in the socket. "'Good night, Signor Adelantado of the Seven Cities,' said the Grand Chamberlain. The sombrero slowly descended. Don Fernando was extinguished. How long he remained extinct, no mortal man can tell. When he returned to consciousness, he found himself in a strange cabin, surrounded by strangers. He rubbed his eyes and looked round him wildly. Where was he? On board a Portuguese ship bound to Lisbon. How came he there? He had been taken senseless from a wreck drifting about the ocean. Don Fernando was more and more confounded and perplexed. He recalled one by one everything that had happened to him in the Isle of the Seven Cities, until he had been extinguished by the sombrero of the Grand Chamberlain. But what had happened to him since? What had become of his caravel? Was it the wreck of her on which he had been found floating? The people about him could give no information on the subject. He entreated them to take him to the island of the Seven Cities, which could not be far off, told them all that had befallen him there, that he had but to land to be received as Adelantado, when he would reward them magnificently for their services. They regarded his words as the ravings of delirium, and in their honest solicitude for the restoration of his reason, administered such rough remedies that he was fain to drop the subject and observe a cautious taciturnity. At length they arrived in the Tagus, and anchored before the famous city of Lisbon. Don Fernando sprang joyfully on shore and hastened to his ancestral mansion. A strange porter opened the door who knew nothing of him or his family. No people of the name had inhabited the house for many a year. He sought the mansion of Don Ramiro. He approached the balcony beneath which he had bidden farewell to Serafina. Did his eyes deceive him? No. There was Serafina herself, among the flowers in the balcony. He raised his arms toward her with an exclamation of rapture. She cast upon him a look of indignation, and hastily retiring, closed the casement with a slam that testified her displeasure. Could she have heard of his flirtation with the Alcade's daughter? But that was mere transient gallantry. A moment's interview would dispel every doubt of his constancy. He rang at the door. As it was opened by the porter, he rushed upstairs, sought the well-known chamber, and threw himself at the feet of Serafina. She started back with a fright, and took refuge in the arms of a youthful cavalier. "'What mean you, signor?' cried the latter. "'By this intrusion!' "'What right have you to ask the question?' demanded Don Fernando fiercely. "'The right of an affianced suitor?' Don Fernando started and turned pale. "'Oh, Serafina, Serafina!' cried he, in a tone of agony. "'Is this thy plighted constancy?' "'Serafina? What mean you by Serafina, signor? If this be the lady you intend, her name is Maria. "'May I not believe my senses? May I not believe my heart?' cried Don Fernando. "'Is not this Serafina Alvarez, the original of yon portrait, which, less fickle than herself, still smiles on me from the wall?' "'Holy Virgin!' cried the young lady, casting her eyes upon the portrait. "'He is talking of my great-grandmother.' An explanation ensued, if that could be called an explanation, which plunged the unfortunate Fernando into tenfold perplexity. If he might believe his eyes, he saw before him his beloved Serafina. If he might believe his ears, it was merely her hereditary form and features, perpetuated in the person of her great-granddaughter. His brain began to spin— he sought the office of the Minister of Marine, and made a report of his expedition, and of the island of the Seven Cities, which he had so fortunately discovered. Nobody knew anything of such an expedition or such an island. He declared that he had undertaken the enterprise under a formal contract with the Crown, and had received a regular commission constituting him adelantado. This must be matter of record, and he insisted loudly that the books of the department should be consulted. The wordy strife at length attracted the attention of an old grey-headed clerk, who sat perched on a high stool at a high desk, with iron-rimmed spectacles on the top of a thin, pinched nose, copying records into an enormous folio. He had wintered and summered in the department for a great part of a century, until he had almost grown to be a piece of the desk at which he sat. His memory was a mere index of official facts and documents, 
and his brain was little better than red tape and parchment. After peering down for a time from his lofty perch, and ascertaining the matter in controversy, he put his pen behind his ear and descended. He remembered to have heard something from his predecessor about an expedition of the kind in question, but then it had sailed during the reign of Don Iom II, and he had been dead at least a hundred years. To put the matter beyond dispute, however, the archives of the Torah do Tombo, that sepulchre of old Portuguese documents, were diligently searched, and the record was found of a contract between the crown and one Fernando de Olmo, for the discovery of the island of the seven cities and of a commission secured to him as adelantado of the country he might discover. There, cried Don Fernando triumphantly, there you have proof before your own eyes of what I have said. I am the Fernando de Olmo specified in that record. I have discovered the island of the seven cities and am entitled to be adelantado according to contract. The story of Don Fernando had certainly, what is pronounced the best of historical foundation, documentary evidence. But when a man, in the bloom of youth, talked of events that had taken place above a century previously, as having happened to himself, it is no wonder that he was set down for a madman. The old clerk looked at him from above and below his spectacles, shrugged his shoulders, stroked his chin, reascended his lofty stool, took the pen from behind his ears, and resumed his daily and eternal task, copying records into the fiftieth volume of a series of gigantic folios. The other clerks winked at each other shrewdly and dispersed to their several places, and poor Don Fernando, thus left to himself, flung out of the office, almost driven wild by these repeated perplexities. In the confusion of his mind he instinctively repaired to the mansion of Alvarez, but it was barred against him. To break the delusion under which the youth apparently labored, and to convince him that the Serafina about whom he raved was really dead, he was conducted to her tomb. There she lay, a stately matron, cut out in alabaster, and there lay her husband beside her, a portly cavalier in armor. And there knelt, on each side, the effigies of a numerous progeny, proving that she had been a fruitful vine. Even the very monument gave evidence of the lapse of time. The hands of her husband, folded as if in prayer, had lost their fingers, and the face of the once lovely Serafina was without a nose. Don Fernando felt a transient glow of indignation at beholding this monumental proof of the inconstancy of his mistress. But who could expect a mistress to remain constant during a whole century of absence? And what right had he to rail about constancy after what had passed between himself and the Alcade's daughter? The unfortunate cavalier performed one pious act of tender devotion. He had the alabaster nose of Serafina restored by a skillful statuary, and then tore himself from the tomb. He could now no longer doubt the fact that, somehow or other, he had skipped over a whole century during the night he had spent at the island of the Seven Cities, and he was now as complete a stranger in his native city as if he had never been there. A thousand times did he wish himself back to that wonderful island, with its antiquated banquet halls, where he had been so courteously received, and now that the once young and beautiful Serafina was nothing but a great-grandmother in marble, with generations of descendants, a thousand times would he recall the melting black eyes of the Alcade's daughter, who doubtless, like himself, was still flourishing in fresh juvenility, and breathed a secret wish that he was seated by her side. He would at once have set on foot another expedition, at his own expense, to cruise in search of the sainted island, but his means were exhausted. He endeavored to rouse others to the enterprise, setting forth the certainty of profitable results of which his own experience furnished such unquestionable proof. Alas, no one would give faith to his tale, but looked upon it as the feverish dream of a shipwrecked man. He persisted in his efforts, holding forth in all places and all companies, until he became an object of jest and jeer to the light-minded, who mistook his earnest enthusiasm for a proof of insanity. And the very children in the streets bantered him with the title of the Adelantado of the Seven Cities. Finding all efforts in vain, in his native city of Lisbon, he took shipping for the Canaries as being nearer the latitude of his former cruise, and inhabited by people given to nautical adventure. Here he found ready listeners to his story, for the old pilots and mariners of those parts were notorious island hunters, and devout believers in all the wonders of the seas. Indeed, one and all treated his adventure as a common occurrence, and turning to each other, with a sagacious nod of the head, observed, He has been at the island of St. Brandon. 
They then went on to inform him of that great marvel and enigma of the ocean, of its repeated appearance to the inhabitants of their islands, and of the many but ineffectual expeditions that had been made in search of it. They took him to a promontory of the island of Palma, whence the shadowy St. Brandon had oftenest been descried, and they pointed out the very tract in the west where its mountains had been seen. Don Fernando listened with rapt attention. He had no longer a doubt that this mysterious and fugacious island must be the same with that of the seven cities, and that some supernatural influence connected with it had operated upon himself, and made the events of a night occupy the space of a century. He endeavored, but in vain, to rouse the islanders to another attempt at discovery. They had given up the Phantom Island as indeed inaccessible. Fernando, however, was not to be discouraged. The idea wore itself deeper and deeper in his mind until it became the engrossing subject of his thoughts and object of his being. Every morning he would repair to the promontory of Palma and sit there throughout the live-long day in hopes of seeing the fairy mountains of St. Brandon peering above the horizon. Every evening he returned to his home, a disappointed man, but ready to resume his post on the following morning. His assiduity was all in vain. He grew gray in his ineffectual attempt, and was at length found dead at his post. His grave is still shown in the island of Palma, and a cross is erected on the spot where he used to sit and look out upon the sea, in hopes of the reappearance of the phantom island. Note. For various particulars concerning the island of St. Brandon and the island of the Seven Cities, those ancient problems of the ocean, the curious reader is referred to the article under those heads in the appendix to The Life of Columbus. End of section 24. Section 